Hello everyone, welcome back. Thanks so much for watching. This video is a little bit about Genesis 22. Of course, the typical Islamic position that you run into is that Ishmael is the son who was nearly sacrificed. In the Christian and Jewish tradition, it's of course Isaac. And I'll talk a little bit about um, you know the the Christian and Jewish perspective here in Genesis 22. The Islamic argument, uh, pretty typical um, representation of it here in Maldudi. I'll just switch to my screen here. This is uh, of course English tafsir. Uh, for Surah 37, go down to the particular passage, um, and, you know, Maldudi talks about Genesis and how Ishmael was born first, and then Isaac was born, then there was some time that's passed, and then here comes Genesis 22, and Genesis 22 talks about Abraham's only son. Well, since Ishmael was born first, that had to have been Ishmael, and so the rest of Genesis 22 that says Isaac contradicts that. So that's um, that's basically what generally you're going to get from Muslims. So Maldudi says, um, this brings out the contradictions of the Bible. It is evident that for 14 years the prophet Ishmael was the only son of prophet Abraham. Now if the offering had been asked of the only son, it was not of Isaac but of Ishmael, for he alone was the only son. And if the offering of Isaac had been asked, it would be wrong to say that the offering of the only son had been asked. Now this is the part I want to focus on. It would be wrong to say that the offering of the only son had been asked. Why? Maldudi doesn't say why. And, and that's my question. Why is it wrong to call Isaac the only son? So, Maldudi, I'll, I'll just bring out you know, something of interest here. Maldudi just, just flat out states this is a contradiction in the Bible. Now, when he addresses the Islamic perspective, he says, now let us consider the Islamic traditions. Uh, there are numerous Islamic scholars who believe that it was Isaac, and then he lists them here. The other group says that it was Ishmael, and then he lists them here. And he goes on and compares the list and so forth. He's pretty careful when he treats the Islamic traditions, but when it comes to the Bible, he just says, oh, that's a contradiction. Uh, good enough. Contradiction, therefore it's unreliable, therefore we can make it say whatever we want it to say. So in this video I'm just going to fill in the blank a little bit with some considerations that Maldudi left out about why Genesis 22 says what it says. So let's uh, go back to my screen here and jump right to the text. Here you have the phrase, uh, take your son, your only son, Isaac. All right, now let's just make some brief observations here. The term only is right here in Hebrew, and if I just click on that, the root is yachav, okay? Yachav, and it means to uh, be united, to designate exclusively. Now that, that's interesting. Was Isaac designated exclusively for something? Hmm. So when you look back a couple of chapters in Genesis 17, uh, you have... Um, God saying, I will bless her, talking about Abraham's wife, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. Abraham said to God, all that Ishmael might live before you. So ba Abraham is saying, I already have a son. It, is Ishmael who you're talking about? God says, no. Now, that's actually not my plan, right? Because Ishmael came about as a result of Sarah's plan. And so you have these statements that are, are positive with respect to Abraham and God, like Abraham believed God and it was reckoned unto him as righteousness. But then you have the other, these other statements. You know, in the context of this story, it says that Abraham listened to Sarah. And that's when you get the Hagar story and Ishmael. But this is God's plan. And it's different from Sarah's plan. And so God says, no. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. I will establish my covenant with him. And he says, I will bless Ishmael. And again, I will establish my covenant with Isaac. Okay, so Isaac is designated uh, specifically for a certain covenant relationship with the God of Israel, and Ishmael is not. Now, taking into account this story with Ishmael and Isaac, I refer to you know what Maldudi says in his commentary as basically the amnesia theory, where um, the the biblical writer, you know, he he does all of this stuff and then he gets to Genesis twenty two and just has a brain dump and all of this stuff is gone. Suddenly he completely forgets about Ishmael and so he writes, yeah, Isaac, Abraham's only son, you know, his only biological son. That's that's not what's going on. So. 
Let's just look at some pretty standard lexicons. This is the DBL, the Dictionary of Biblical Languages. And I have this word selected. Now you can see it looks a little bit different. Um, in the, the Hebrew Bible here, there's a different consonant that's not here, and the vowel pointings are a little bit different. And that's just because um, where it occurs in Genesis 22.2, it's inflected. It has a, a suffix on the end of it, I should say. It's suffixed with a 2ms suffix. So whenever you add those consonants on the end of a Hebrew word, that changes the way the, way the word is accented, and it can change the vowels, and that's what happens here. But it's the same word, and it says... Only unique child, i.e. pertaining to a child very special in the eyes of the parent. And in that sense, unique. That's very well said. He quotes Zechariah 12.10 as a place where this occurs again. Uh, towards the bottom of that verse, it says, and I can't move my mouse because the magnifier will drag off it. Let me just click on it. So Zechariah 12.10, uh, They shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child as one weeps over a firstborn. So this is an example of Hebrew parallelism. You have uh, two lines that are communicating a very similar thought. And in one line, it's firstborn. And in the other line, it's the only child. But you can be the firstborn without being the only child. Yet they're treated sort of in parallel. It's because they're both terms of significance. Okay, they're talking about um, a special relationship. And so that's why that, that text is relevant. Um, the JPS Torah commentary series, of course, I talk a lot about Islamic anti-Semitism on my channel. And I love quoting Jewish scholars, one, because they're, they're very good. Uh, the, the JPS Torah commentary series here, and also because of Islamic anti-Semitism. I mean, who better to quote than a Jewish scholar? So about this Hebrew construction, this is uh, Nahum Sarna. He says, your favored one. So that's how it's translated in the new JPS translation, the Jewish Publication Society. Literally, your only one. So it gives a literal reading, here construed as a term of value. We go to the, uh, the Septuagint. This is um, translated as agapetos. Okay, so again, a, a term of special love, of special uh, relationship there translated beloved. So this didn't confuse the Septuagint translators. Didn't confuse them at all. They didn't feel a need to say, wait a second, he wasn't the only biological son. They realize what the text is saying, and so they translate accordingly. I have... Um, Hebrews 11.17 pulled up here as well. It talks about Isaac and his only son. Okay, this is first century, right? And the writer of Hebrews knew the Old Testament very well, and he knew that Abraham had two biological sons, Isaac and Ishmael. He knew that. Yet he calls Isaac his only son. Okay, let's check the New International Greek Commentary. Uh, this is uh, really good if you know Greek, an ex excellent series, the NIGTC. It says, Isaac was not, in fact, at this time, Abraham's only son, but in Jewish tradition, Ishmael does not count as a child of promise, and Hebrews concurs. So the context here is the child of promise, and there was only one, and that was Isaac. Uh, from the Hermeneia commentary series, the designation usefully emphasizes the unique status of Isaac as the one through whom God's promise was to be fulfilled, and thus highlights the faith of Abraham. So I quoted these texts you know, from Hebrews, again, first century, the Septuagint, to show that for thousands of years, there's been no problem understanding what Genesis 22 is saying. And then Muslims come along, and they want the text to say what they want it to say. Or if it can't be made to do that, then they just want to cry contradiction so that they can disregard it. But there are actually very good reasons why Genesis 22 says what it says, and you've seen those from both lexicons and uh, from commentaries as well, and from other uses, both in the Septuagint as well as in the book of Hebrews. So I hope that helps fill in some of the blanks. You know, Muslims, if you're honestly interested in understanding this stuff, you don't have to put in any effort. Just watch the video and be open to what it says, and be open to the fact that your scholars may be a little quick to call in to question the biblical text. So that's all for this video. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.